All right, everybody, let's get started here. So, uh, welcome. Today we've got April 10, Tuesday, regular meeting. So we got Abe here. Anyone else? Is John, John on the call? Okay, well, we get started anyway. So, everyone who's on the meeting here, so as far as the, the first page, what I'd like to do uh, just to get the meetings organized better is to, whenever people are uh, looking at the agenda, filling in their work, please uh, write in the time amount of time that you'd like. Like, for example, here I'd like to talk about the introduction for like 15 minutes. I was thinking maybe Abe has got like 15 minutes here. Uh, but if so that we can basically gauge how long each meeting needs to last, I'd like to keep them efficient as possible. And today I, I actually need to cut out very sharp at 3 p.m. So <clears throat> hopefully we get through everything as needed here. So let's start on the agenda here. So I'll go over the critical path, uh, stream manufacturing competition, co-opetition. I'll, I'll make a little note about that. Microfactory update. Uh, First Robotics Oklahoma and Print Cluster. A uh, bunch of different work I've been doing on, on um, huh, largely on the 3D printer. Then we, we'll get Abe on the power cube and tractor work. I know John's doing some work on the D3D, Ohio, uh, but nobody else filled in uh, yet, so so let's just continue. So if we look at the progress here, so uh, we're kind of like at around 100 or so hours per week, so we're kind of kind of have a little dip of dip of effort, but we'll, we'll get that up as we get going in the year. Let's start with, uh, <clears throat> so l let's actually go to page number. I'll, I'll put that right below the notes here. And let me share my screen here. So screen share. OK, so please take a look at the screen. Um, critical path. Just to review, I've been refining this and kind of getting really focused on what the year deliverables are. And definitely the, the most outstanding thing to keep in mind is the immersion program. You can click on the link for the actual critical path. But the immersion program coming in September, October. So very clear goals. Uh, six full-time people by end of 2018 that is my personal goal i'm trying to really commit to that and make it happen in the best way possible in other words people who would be running workshops uh, primarily on a 3d printer and as we get the the little circuit mill and the laser cutter and other machines like the extruder filament maker filament grinder in place we can start with that as a robust package because of course 3d printers are big they're they're very popular they're very practical tools and we want to get to the larger scale versions like say two by two foot work working surface where we can do things than like print rubber tracks for the tractor I mean basically um, there's a whole load of parts that we can one by one replace and all the things that we use right now including things like cordless drills and so forth because if you imagine you know take a think about a cordless drill it's a bunch of plastic plus some, some motors and batteries and a little bit of electronics well that's where the 3D printer, circuit mill come in to pretty much build a whole range of electromechanical devices. So very important. Um, okay, so main goal, September immersion program. So all this development until then is really focused around that uh, with the, let me actually go to this one here, with the 3D printer, a lot of development on that. The first real workshop on a, on a calendar is Eugene, about June 20, it's gonna be June 21st. I'm speaking out there and and for that I'm preparing the, the plastic frame D3D, but with an upgraded, like lots of improvements. So one main thing is using the E3D hot end with volcano nozzles. So there's, there's one called the E3D Titan Arrow. AERO 
that's that's a extruder that's an extruder that fits all our needs it can it can work both with the volcano nozzle and it can do rubber it's it's designed for rubber printing meaning flexible filaments so that's big time and last year we built a two by two foot printer we never got it running but i'm gonna work on finishing that will uh it will be interesting to see the larger prints and how that works in practice uh focusing on the scalability of the like the PV pvc d3d version where you can make i mean pipe is easy to scale up so the frame is very easy to scale up and um, I'd say the one of the biggest value propositions that we have is the construction set approach. So I'd really like to nail this down where we, we're building 3D printers of all sizes. We have a standard model, but then we have a construction set with a D3D workbench, a design guide where people can design their own uh, and have that become a very respected way that if you want to build a printer fast and cheap and high performance, this is the way to go. So that's that's kind of the way. Um, let's see what else we got. So, so that's that's the main thing about the roadmap. Um, definitely working on a book. So the red, red parts are my tasks. I'm working on a book. So, so every day I'm putting a few hours to to write the book, which is going to be critical for culture setting and path setting for the immersion program as we go forward. So, and some other things here. Let you see the Hero X Micro Factory that's still on a drawing board. Um, Twelve inch D three D with large extruder. Getting back to the Lyman filament maker, D3D laser cutter, plastic shredder. Those those all go to the micro factory. So so the theme, the central theme of the of the immersion training is the basic small tool micro factory. And you see here towards the end, it's we're gonna run a lot of workshops, several workshops every month. Um, and the other thing that I I thought about recently is is once we have the small micro factory, we can get into the design jams. And let me just go into that. So. Uh, following up on the, right on the schedule okay one thing with the 3d printer that's that a 3d printer allows is is having that connected to the internet so you can actually do a pr print on demand service so this is the open source print cluster i think that's that's a good thing for collaboration with a lot of different people who want to set up a home-based or a small enterprise running a few printers up to say 100 printers or whatever but that could be controlled through the internet and created into an online on-demand printing platform. So for us to print parts for us, to print different part kits for all the different machines and so forth. So I've been exploring the different um, architectures, but but the one that we're settling on pretty much right now is having the computer, um, which talks to a Raspberry Pi Zero, and the Pi Zero controls the Arduino, the ramps on a 3D printer. So each Pi Zero could take a few, could um, control a few printers, and since the Pi Zero is only like ten dollars, Pi Zero W with wireless, it's ten dollars. So I was thinking the best route would be perhaps a Pi Zero for every four computers, four printers, in case there's a failure. I mean, the Pi Zero should be very, very stable. But in case there's a failure, like whenever you have a print failure on the server side, which is the Pi Zero, it would only take down four printers instead of like a hundred printers. But that's that's just a thought, and we'll see how it goes in practice. We might have each Pi Zero do more than four, but that's probably a likely um, likely outcome. It has to be scalable, open source, low cost. Uh, Octoprint is well developed. That's really working for us. Octoprint is a high quality print server software, so that's that's really good. Um, but that's if you th think about the print cluster where you you know you actually submit your credit card and you pay for a print online getting either custom parts or parts from our part library set um, I think that's that's an awesome enterprise and it's worth developing okay next I started on the 3d printer design guide look at that so that's one of the assets we need to create to to work to basically get everyone designing their own 3d printers and Here it is. The, so basically, how do you do it? You got a frame, you've got the universal axis, and then you can start with a frame, putting on the different axes. The frame can be scaled in many different, I mean, this, this is totally scalable. It's made of flats, cut out of CN, CNC flats. Uh, but what, once again, we can do the PVC, which we're exploring right now, and I'm pretty confident that's going to work. I mean, I'm just getting the PVC printer up and running here, it looks really positive. We could definitely make it work. For super high quality printing and then the scalability is much easier because cutting pvc pipe to length is much easier 
than cutting metal to size. In fact, when I think about it, it's when you think about, okay, you gotta expand the size of it. Well, that's a big CNC cutting job. You gotta go to the torch table or whatever device that's cutting your metal. Um, so PVC makes it very easy. Once you got the frame, you start fitting in the axes, the universal axes. Start with Y1, add Y2. And that's as far as I got, but, but then that's, that's a start for the design guide. Moving on. Uh, so here's the, once again, a little bit more on a personal micro factory. The uses are several, and, and I'll bring this up uh, more as we go here. But it's a small machine set that you can run in your home, in your garage. It's a practical, scalable platform. 3D printer uh, with a 3D print head, laser head, CNC circuit mill. So the thing is, we can do production of new printers, for example, if we run workshops. So what are the use cases, I'm asking? We can do extreme jams, so that's a concept I brought about last time, uh, where we get together to do a workshop followed by a weekend of prototyping. And the challenge there is that it takes time to prototype, but one thing we could do definitely if we bring our filament maker, plastic grinder, to, a, to an event, think about a cookbook basically designing 3D printer, printer filaments, especially metal ones, so we know that there's... Um, what's it called F uh, what is it Fil forge virtual foundry it's got metal embedded printing filaments that when you bake them you center the metal and it becomes a hundred percent metal and the results on, on that are pretty positive so one thing we could do for example is having exploratory design jams where we experiment with okay let's get some metal powders put it into PLA and extrude our uh, printing filament see if it works and maybe have a national competition like that I was thinking that would be a great thing to do with chapters. Uh, once we get chapters started and different people working around the U.S., say we do like a, a monthly big design jam <clears throat> or extreme design jam, and we have, you know, we're competing to make the best filament or something, or prototype of the tractor using a scale scale prototyping or whatever that may be. Okay, and then that kind of actually leads me to Abe, right into Abe, where. What I was going to suggest, um, so this third point here, 3D printer plus small laser to make scale models. Abe, what we got to do is we got to set you up like as soon as we can to a 3D printer and a small laser. So for example, when you're doing the work on a tractor, you can also prototype the scale model where you see everything, how it fits in place. There's a little missing link, and, and the thing that's been troubling us before was accurate CAD of the parts, like, for example, the motor that wasn't accurate for last time. Uh, but photogrammetry, I, I was actually going to ask you how you feel about photogrammetry, if we could maybe do, do an experiment where you download... Uh, if you go to the, the wiki photogrammetry, there should be a page. There's a good program and a recent video by the Prusa, and what is this? Uh, I think it might be, I don't know why I can't find it, open source photogrammetry. So if you take a look at that, look at call map. That's what Joseph Prusa suggests for 3D scanning. But the relevance of that is immediately, for example, the engine or the pump. And I know you, you might not have the exact pump or engine, but we should get good at this photogrammetry tool chain, develop it so that we can get accurate parts. And that could be something that we could do in our design jams. We bring a part that's an unknown, like a pump, and then we scan it and work it so we get a perfect model as a re result as part of the work that goes on in a design jam. So uh, it's just something to get you thinking on that, but, but I think photogrammetry is something maybe you can put that into your roadmap down the road after you get far enough on the tractor and power cubes to actually prototype it accurately but then then we'd wanna uh, get a 3d printer and small laser to do that and yeah so hey maybe you can continue on a power cube and I can ask you some more questions but I, I, I brought out a point here 
how about an extreme design jam somewhere in Arkansas? You're you're like five hours away, and I'd be willing to go down there if we do a, a workshop slash design jam somewhere in a big city, so we can get a few people and do like a weekend event or something. That's just a thought, but something that definitely could be done. Okay, Abe, why don't you continue? Okay, uh, I've been taking some notes. Yeah. Uh, trying to keep up with that. So what I've been doing on let's see this morning the past week on the power cube I hadn't really I guess I didn't do much tab this week but I, I started doing more of the file stuff trying to catch up on that mm -hmm. and uh, see I've been trying to copy I decided that I needed to copy a lot more of these uh, files and template, the templates and stuff and get that kind of organized because uh, some of that seems a little out of date and, and more of the files I think need to be copied anyway I was kind of thinking that if it would be uh, one of the things that, that takes a lot of time is some degree, especially for a particular machine, it's easy to probably have a folder for the power cube or whatever and just copy all the files over every time, but you still have to like individually embed like all the files with code into the wiki every time you want to make a new version of the, uh, of uh -huh. the particular file, so that, that takes a little time. I was trying to figure out ways to make that to make that easier, but templates just kind of getting, getting there and doing it. Um, yeah, except for with the Google Docs, you know, publishing them each time you have to copy you copy the files. Like, it might be easier if there was just a folder for like the power key, you know, folder and you just, from the last version, you just copy the whole folder over again. And then the new version is probably similar enough to the old version, you know, you just update the new file from the Google Docs. And the wiki pages, you know, they can be kind of copied, made into templates, all that. You know, we have templates of, of the, you know, the Google Docs, whatever. But it, you have to embed, you know, the, the files. We're embedding those into the wiki, so you have to click publish, and you have to do all that for every single file. But that's not, that's not that bad. It's just yeah. Public, let me um. Well, let me let me pipe in on that just a little bit because I've been thinking about that as well. I do believe that. If you would have just the URL, like without going to publish within uh, the Google Doc itself, like for example, if I look at um, the current, okay, let's let's take a and let's look at that right now because that would be worthwhile to see if that actually works. But you have the main identifier of a of a particular doc, like um, if you look at my screen. For example, uh, there's that identifier. And now when you publish, because for example, what if we could make a template within the wiki that just requires that only? Because if that's so, then we could pass that as a parameter into a template. But let's take a look at that. So say what happens when we go to, to file, publish to the web. Does that um, get retained? No doesn't look like it. it it looks like it draws up this totally different yeah, yeah. no that wouldn't work all right forget that yeah. plan but Who knows? yeah more automatable but it's you know it's a few documents but yeah you know everything takes a little bit of time but you know uh, i'll just um i don't know i guess they just have to make a, a standard way of you know copying the documents over when we start a project each time or something but because um, I think it's easier just to copy them all, and you know, even though there's some that are probably the same, or some you can just reference the old ones, but copy everything almost seems easy. Plus, there shouldn't be any excess, you know, data because compression and deduplication should take all of care of extra files on the back end. So, um, copying it and linking everything on, you know, each version of a of a project machine, you know, seems like it's just easier to keep track of everything, because uh, a bunch of stuff gets left out or not linked to sometimes, so it's easier to just have a template to some degree that you can copy easily and then make sure there's links to everything. Well, um, what do you think about uh, templatizing the actual development template, which is right now embedded as a Google Doc? I mean, we can do a a template within the wiki where you just type in the name of that machine like say PowerCube version 18.05 let's say and that's the parameter you pass into the template and then it gives you the entire 
wiki-based markup of that template that you then just click and then when you click on it, it actually open make creates that page automatically so you don't have to t uh, actually yeah. paste in any of the links to the products Yeah. On the wiki. I mean, there's the GPCS templates that look like there was a lot of work done on that. Yeah. And that stuff doesn't get reused very much, but. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's different ways to do it. I mean, I think stuff got into Google Docs, put more in there because it's more collaborative than the wiki. I think that was the right. issue there, right? So, um, you know, the Google Docs have their drawbacks, but they're, they're embeddable. So, uh, with the collaborative. Right. Uh, but then we don't, you know, even though we don't have a lot of people working on stuff right now, it's still just a better, more collaborative way with the documents, right? Yeah. So, I guess, uh, text here. Yeah, hey, John. Um, and I've noticed there's a lot of things to edit. Um, a lot more stuff to edit in the bombs and things than I thought, too. Uh, Right. I mean, um, the way it should work all together is, you know, say we did a version, we maybe didn't get to document everything perfectly, which is the normal case. We carry over, then we start a new version. Then the cool thing is that you can pick all the old information off the old work and therefore you can rapidly fill in a new template and then fill in the missing pieces that were not there before so so in principle just moving forward and copying stuff over to new versions can be a decent way to go it, it only requires that we carry over the links um, to to the new template if we use the the embedded template so yeah yeah documentation in a lot of times is, is kind of secondary to getting stuff done on the cat. I mean, it, it is important that we kind of yeah. the machines and get all that stuff done first to some extent because just the nature of uh, the way we're doing things. I mean, we got to create something that's interesting. So Right. And the biggest asset there is if we have the CAD that anyone can download, that's, of course, the main critical asset. And for that, we're doing fine. Like right now, we go to the wiki and say there's a project we can quickly identify, get right down to the cat. I mean, that's the most critical item. So at least yeah. there, we're we're pretty decent um, right now. I guess as an aside to some of that, I mean, obviously, information, what kind of centralized, packaged, um, oh well, information is kind of centralized on the wiki and everything, and that's probably best for uh, or some psychologies, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the way stuff is shared. But for some things, 
it seems like sometimes for certain data packages, uh, it seems like it would be great if it was available on portable media, you know, like the, with the Linux to some degree, but I, I think that's a broader... Um, uh, what do you mean by that? Um, well, for certain files, especially, I know there's a bunch of projects whereby they distribute data, like I have a local copy of Wikipedia somewhere, which seems crazy, but it's just... I used to have poor internet more than I do so now. And so that was handy sometimes. And there's other projects where in more developing countries where they have poor internet and things like that, they distribute uh, copies of things like Khan Academy, Wikipedia, all right. that kind of stuff. And they do like local internet things. Usually it's around schools and stuff. And so a lot of it's educational, but people share information more locally in some developing countries, which would be interested in a lot of this stuff. So having certain software packages like that with data uh, on some sort of distributed media would be handy and it might help, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of public relations too, I guess. Well, we do have some of that. Act. Did you know that Outernet has the GVCS in space now floating in a satellite somewhere? <laughs> well, they do. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Okay. That's awesome. So if the, if the Earth collapses, at least we can get build tractors and brick presses. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think the the thing we want to do like once we okay, so we're saying that for this September's immersion training and the 3D printer work, I mean, we're getting down to the design guide and once we get enough like I mean, hopefully by September, I guess, but by that time we have to have um some pretty good documentation that we could publish as a book like as here's our design guide. Here's our instructionals and so forth, and and send that into space as well. Yeah, uh, that's something that, that kind of gets into the publishing thing, where Scribus is the open source publishing platform uh, that we want to use for that. So we can probably do it in Scribus and make make publishable, high quality materials, as well as with the you know I mean we do have another deadline for all, end of August is the deadline for publishing the all the materials on a CD cajon. So that's no, that's how we're going to do that. July, August is going to be a lot of work on that, but we got to publish that. Our deadline for the Kickstarter rewards is the end of August, and we kind of are really committing to that because we don't want the that Kickstarter CD home thing to drag out any longer because we got to move on to some other things too. So, um, yeah, but publishing and the way I see it happening right now, my greatest hope on a t increasing the team and growing is. Well, first of all, the immersion program. We're going to get applicants where people are required to be on a de development team for a little bit, at least, in order to apply. And the second thing is the the Hero X Challenge, which is going to just get a lot of visibility. So, and then once we start the workshops, like uh, June starts the 3D printer workshops, that's going to be getting more out there as we finalize these versions. I'm pretty optimistic about the the small printer that I'm doing right now it's just the eight inch bed but then scaling it up to the the two foot bed two square foot two by two feet I mean that's that's pretty impressive and if we can show that that's doable really easily I mean essentially with all the same parts I'm showing on the screen right now here um, I think that would be a huge value add especially when this we have quick interchange tool head so you can put on your laser you can you can modify this readily to be your uh, CNC circuit mill and so forth I think that's gonna work uh, especially with the with the filament maker that people can start recycling if if we can start doing that I think that's a huge value proposition that you know whatever say we go um, do a workshop at a school or something we start start them on recycling taking all their plastics and making 3d printing filament things like that so there's definitely a lot of work to be uh, good stuff to be done with the 3d printing and just in publishing in general we can get get our work out there yep yeah, I looked at the photogrammetry stuff a little bit. I watched the before we talked about that last week. So yeah. I guess I'll have to look at that tool chain closer. Yeah. Um, yeah and I definitely need a um, need to get on a, a you know a three D printer kit or whatever. I can yeah. start small or medium or whatever. But I gotta forget where to where to I guess put it in. Yeah. Uh, Let's um. Together. Uh, like a living space near my desktop because I don't know how much the plastic smells 
Uh, yeah, it depends what you use. If you use PLA, it's fine. But if you use ABS, that smells. So you'd be, if you have it in your, in your workspace, you want to use the bioplastic like PLA. That's that's pretty fine. It doesn't smell. It smells kind of nice actually. So. Of course, it can be done wirelessly, right? So oh yeah. Oh yeah. And that's the that's the addition that we're we're working on. We want to develop, as I was talking about, in the print cluster. Already, Christian has done an initial version of the OSC D3D print cluster. We actually have an image for that using OctoPrint. But uh, yeah, we just want to make that a standard feature for our 3D printers. Because yeah, it is a pain that you have to compromise. Well, you have to dedicate pretty much a computer to that. So you want to just send that job to the Raspberry Pi Zero and just let it go. Yep. Yeah, let's see, as far as the, let's see, the extreme design jams are going to more locally, um, that, you know, a lot of rural people to some degree should this kind of stuff because it's easier to have and uh, you know, do some things in, in rural areas, but um, I think Fayetteville is probably the closest city to hell of this, plus the area, it's a major college, university, metropolis, if that's, uh, they, you know, Little Rock, but Know, they'd be more interested in like uh, they might have some type of uh, maker spaces there. I'm not sure how much of that there is in Little Rock, but mm -hmm. uh, Fayetteville would probably be a good one. Uh, they have a, what's the university? Uh, university of Arkansas? Yeah, the University of Arkansas. So, oh, cool. Yeah, Four hours, the, 30 minutes. The uh, northwest metropolis is kind of there. There's a huge area with lots of other college towns. It's so, and they, yeah. they have all kinds of related stuff there. Uh, there's a lot of, of course, farming, agriculture related stuff. But, uh, yeah. Well, that's actually pretty good. I mean, interested. I'm looking at the map, four hours, 30 minutes. So I think we should plan for something like, so June, late June is going to be the, the Eugene, Oregon. But after that, I'd say I just shoot down there. We should, should organize something for mid-July or something. Um, yeah. Now that's vacation time though, so the university's kind of like not in season, right? Yeah. That's probably true, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the only yeah, issue. I, I don't know, um, the university, the university probably a place to do that because there's lots of space there, but um, they might be interested in that. I'm yeah. sure you have plenty of success setting, setting up uh, talks. And, and, uh, yeah, and then we can go straight visit straight to Bentonville, Arkansas, <laughs> the home of Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, the Grocers Association is over there. RFID Research Center. Familiar with that. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, I mean, the vision for us is that the future is where you walk into a place, the OSE Walmart, and there you have all your fabrication equipment where you p produce on demand within the experience economy. That's... That's what it's. That's what it's about. Okay, but yeah, let's uh, let's think about that. So, definitely, let's let's shoot for something in July. Because what I want to do is before the immersion program, I want to make sure I get a lot of experience where we can just go off to a, even a public library, uh, even do like a free workshop, and then people who who sign up for the workshop if they want to buy the printer, sure they can, and we can bootstrap fund that way. I mean, there, I think there's just a lot of opportunity for. Uh, 3d printing and especially like the if you package it as okay we start we're, we're doing recycling so we're doing recycling and prototyping because um, we have if we have the ability to make the filament so that would be yeah. really really cool okay yeah, well let's that. yeah yeah okay so let's move on um, uh, yeah so keep going and see what you, you know Abe, I think it would be a good priority if we can work out the photogrammetry tool chain because that's something we can completely add. You know, say there's a bunch of people during a design jam, that's something that a team could definitely work on in parallel. So we're trying to design an event where there's so many different things you can do in parallel without bottlenecking one to the other. So I think uh, just getting a, a cell phone where you take the pictures with it and then do some processing with that. I think that's definitely parallelizable for the whole workflow. Okay, um, move on to to John. So I'm looking at your 3D printer. That's looking pretty good. Right. We've got the the new 
extruder head, which is the Prusa i3 MK2, with an with a hacked eight millimeter uh, sensor instead of the four millimeter. And why? Because uh, with the PEI surface that we're using, sometimes we have trouble getting too close to the to the surface. So the eight millimeter gives us some clearance. Yep. Uh, John, then John, any uh, comments on where you're at? Right. So I made some adjustments here uh, based on the last meeting we've had. A, you know, we had a layoff in the family at Devonia, but everything's a bit better. Got adjustments finally done. I uh, All right. rotated the x-axis 180 degrees, uh, so it more reflects uh, other builds. Okay. Uh, then I have uh, dropped down the y-axis, so it's mounting using the. Um, nut catchers to you know sort of drill a jig hole into the uh, plastic yep and uh attach the y-axis there versus on the sides like i had before right um, that's good you know, just the frame size and uh you know tonight or you know next chance i can get is measurements and produce the measurements uh, uh, document again i'm having some issues i want to so i've also uh here we get a short idler onto right that would be um, good Right. Did you see the link I put in uh, in your slide? Okay. Uh, Take a look yeah. at that link, and there's a version that's the original. That's okay. let's see, April 17. Um, yeah, the file started as 120k, and then I shrunk it down to 5k. So it's the super simplified awesome. version. If you don't need to edit, I mean, uh, maybe you can just use that because you only need the pads if you oh, yeah. if you need to edit it. So, I mean, you can just use that. Uh, but that, yeah, uh, but that means if you change the x-axis there, this one, right there, that means your frame could shrink up a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, we could do some uh, shrinkage on uh -huh. the plus material the frame, which is good. Yeah, yep, that's good. So. Yeah, yeah. So continue yeah, doing that. See if you can refine that. And so basically, you're getting the range of motion. Like you, you can move that. Your uh, is it easy to move the right. axes? Like for example, let's see. Um, I have some, some excess uh, rods here. So yeah, I've done the, uh, some calculations with that uh, 500 millimeter uh, rod. I'm able to move the uh, print head over the course of the entire 12 inch uh, sheet there. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I just need to be able to get full range of motion, and I'm gonna uh, produce my calculations document with, um, you know, screenshots of it, you know, copying mm -hmm. every axis so I can move fully. And what about build height? Uh, what's been good for build height? I just kind of made it. Uh, yeah, I mean, like if you're gonna do, tw you know, make it 12 by 12 by 12, it'll be fine. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. cost us much to go higher, like. Like you can readily extend extend in a Z direction because the bed yeah, is the yeah. same. I think I'll make it for now just symmetric. Yeah, uh, yeah, just yeah. Because that's a good um, solid starting. Yeah, place. definitely, definitely. You want to start start with a twelve inch or you know if you get ten or twelve inches that's that's good. Um, twelve inches would be ideal. And how are you moving? Like if you if you observe the whole range of motion, how do you move the? Do you just take the extruder and move it say over like 12 inches so, yeah I move, I move the pad and i move it and i move it over um i i make a line feature on the uh, print bed and then i move the um the pad in the center of the axis and the extruder to, um do a move that's constrained to an axis because i just do like a view on the uh yz a yz view and then i just that over to the side to that axis you know, that feature i made an axis to make sure the extruder tip lines up with that and make sure i have a little bit excess at that you know 10 millimeters excess something like that make sure it covers the whole bed 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, it doesn't run into the end stop and all the rest of that stuff. So yeah. Out. For the purpose of testing, another useful thing that you might want to do is you can take the entire assembly, like the whole carriage with the extruder and these side blocks, and just group them. And that way you can move yeah. the entire thing as one. That's another way to do it. But yeah, it just takes a little bit of time, but should be done. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I grew up the, uh, yeah, definitely need those calculations on it. And, you know, have that straight, and then group the extruder and that pad and just move it. Yeah, all these calculations are just key, because then, you know, we know it's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it's looking like it might be around, you know, 20 inches. Uh, looks like the right length um, when I played around with the short idler. Um, yep. The covers everything nicely. It leaves a little bit of uh, wiggle wiggle through on the sides. So that's probably what I'm going to end up with. But, um, we'll yep. Looks like it's going to be a 20-inch cube. All right. Well, that sounds good. Sounds good. So let's let's move on here. Um, Ruslan, you want to continue? Yeah, probably. Please do. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is just strange for me, but maybe there are reasons for it. Or there is at least one reason, and uh, there's some uh, compatibility with uh, another work page uh, arc architecture. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, there is also a well, possibility that um, for me uh, the current implementation of people in Flamingo looks strange, but uh, I have no experience. Uh, this is a tiny crooked thing that I think I, I have a good idea, but uh, the, the truth is I have uh, almost uh, no knowledge. Uh -huh. 
about this topic. Uh, can you send a link to that? Is that in your log or? I don't see it in your log. Or is it? Page eight on your piping workbench. No, no, you just you just looked at it. Uh, the cu uh, current meeting. Ah, uh, that's what. Okay, page eight there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Do you currently have an inferiority complex about your, your Python code? C code is always nasty, no matter what. There's usually not much you can do. <laughs> yeah, don't don't be uh, don't worry about it. It's, it's going to be all right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds like we need a style guide or to adapt a standard style guide. Is that maybe suggesting? Uh, I know that's pretty standard for most organizations, as I understand. It is. Yeah, that is a thing. Okay. Adapt the style guide. That's yes. the best you can do. Now, there could be endless debate about the style guide, but, um, you know, let's adapt something that's good. Try to stick with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, feel free to start a wiki page right now. Uh, OSC Python. I mean, is OSC Python style guide different than just a Python style guide? Really? So OSC Python style guide. Page started. Started right here. Exactly. It's best practices, and of course, people should follow them. And they're. Now I have a task. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Is it, is it so much that we should design a style guide uh, for OSE? There's probably easily ones that are popular. 
Yeah, we should start with one that's already there. Right, right. I could link to him. I got you know about flex song, but uh, you know, I think programming and stuff and engineering so I can uh, look so, like Microsoft has standard styles and how you should write comments, how you should block code, and when you should write a class versus when you should just do it inside of a uh, function or something. So there's, there's stuff like that. So I can uh, maybe link to that. Yeah, and and is there um, do we have a wiki page called Python 101 yet? Let's let's see that. If not, we should, because Python is, uh, for example, robot operating system ROS that they use Python. FreeCAD uses Python, so it's a critical language. Yeah. And uh, but also uh, to have a good code, and uh, probably some parts will have a different code styles. Nevertheless, it's good to have some good start points so where, where to look for style guides. Right, and we do have already a Python 101 page on a wiki, so we can also contribute to that. But yeah, just uh, I mean, what is the best best Python 101 course out there? We should you know should maybe know that. Um, yeah, so we can contribute to that. I see a lot of the codes, a lot of code in general, including just stuff that's pretty professional. It seems to me that what I was taught stuff, I didn't learn a lot of coding and that kind of stuff, but I was kind of taught that documentation was more important, and it seems like the people don't like to document it. Obviously, that's it's kind of a general, obvious thing. People kind of skip that, but it seems like we need to emphasize that Especially since we're probably yeah. trying to write code more for um, novices, things like that, and just need a lot of documentation in the code. So what? What I'm gonna say real quick here in your know, professional environment, doing the software programming, designing backends and stuff. Here's how this is typically done. I mean, you have some basic conventions and style like that you can here from Microsoft for C and uh, C sharp and stuff like that. You have those. How people structure code. But what we really could love or just love to see is um, things that are called um, format generators. So, for instance, Microsoft Visual Studio, Python, all the rest, they have tools that uh, generate like a, basically, a tree structure of how the code works, how one function links, links in another function. There's uh, Doxygen, there's a whole bunch of different tools for generating documentation from code, and someone has done within the code. So the key standard is how people abide by formatting the standards like anything there, and then also have people like um, make sure they inline comments to what their functions do. And just say at minimum, you need to say, hey, what goes into this? What does it do? What goes out of it? And you know, say that's what you're expected to put in for every function you have. And then these kind of tools where it allows them to produce a tree structure, to give them a review, and then automatic documentation could be located somewhere. So. Uh, we can have like readme's for our programs, even though people, they, they, we, you know, we want to have automated documentation as one of our main goals. You know, but, uh, that's kind of how we can do it here. here. Uh huh. Yeah. That, yeah. That um, sounds good. Um, not that familiar the automated documentation. I would kind of add about the breakdown of the let's see the formatting and the breakdown of classes. I'm kind of I think that Arduino, which is a little more familiar with kind of breaks things down into small, simple classes a lot for easeability, and the way OSC has a lot of projects that kind of use that same kind of hardware over and over again, and hopefully use the same code in multiple machines and projects over again, we might want to make a, have a style that favors more smaller classes or whatever matches up with the reusability for all of the machines. I have a I had a problem with the Python documentation, and the problem was uh, it's hard to find what they actually uh, want. Um, if there is some official uh, documentation 
Okay. Hey guys, um, I got a sharp cutoff at, at 3 p.m. Do you guys want to just continue talking a little bit, and I'll just leave it recording? But I gotta, I gotta get going.